Imagine a world where criminals operate with near impunity. A place where credit card information can be bought for as little as one euro, but where some put the total cost of the crimes annually at one trillion dollars. That's 770 billion euros. Welcome to On the Front Line, where we're looking at the battle against organized crime in the cyber world. And as Paul Hackett reports, the authorities are upping their fight against the dark side of the net. Winning is by no means a foregone conclusion. More malware and computer nasties than ever before. That's the prediction from cyber security experts for 2013. As our dependence on the internet grows, the opportunity for fraudsters and other criminals to take advantage is also increasing dramatically. We're seeing about 260,000 individual new pieces of malicious code every single day, which is a pretty terrifying volume when you consider that only three years ago that figure was around the 50,000 mark. On that basis, you're much more likely to run into malicious code and hackers today on the internet. Hamburg's probably not the first place you'd associate with hackers, but thousands of computer geeks have gathered here to talk shop and all things good, bad and ugly about the internet. The Chaos Computer Club has in the past famously cracked government IT systems to identify flaws. They admit the authorities are catching up with the cyber criminals, but say more must be done to inform the public. What we're seeing is that governments and security agencies are increasingly focused on, on cyber crime. Uh, a, because there's a problem, there's a lot of cyber crime going on. And on the other hand, because it's a new way to uh, gain new powers and new rights. It is a twofold problem. On one hand, the users need to get cyber smart, smart in one way. <clears throat> on the other hand, uh, companies and government need to basically do more for education and do more for risk awareness. With billions being stolen each year, Europe has just opened its new cybercrime centre based at Europol in The Hague. Its main focus will be to fight organised crime groups making massive profits from online fraud, particularly theft of credit card and bank details. While welcome, experts say more international cooperation is needed. It's actually great to see the uh, European Cybercrime Centre being opened, recognising that cybercrime is more of a borderless issue. And I do think that Europe is starting to take cybercrime more seriously. Unfortunately, we also have to tackle this on a more global basis, and we need international regulations that enable us to make life much, much harder for cybercriminals. Getting such rules on how to govern the web is unlikely to happen quickly, especially when countries like Russia and China refuse to take part in international initiatives. I'm joined on the front line by Trolls Erting, who's the head of Europol's new cybercrime centre in The Hague, and Rick Ferguson, technical wizard and director of security at Trend Micro. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Right. Trolls, there's no international consensus as to what cybercrime actually is. There are no international treaties. So the Europol Centre that you're now head of is kind of hamstrung from the start. It's not easy, uh, but on the other side, it's not impossible. What we do is that we use the European uh, Cybercrime Convention as a basis for what is cybercrime. Because I agree with you, it's, it's difficult to make a definition. It's also difficult because we need to have agreements with other parts of the world. But if we can have at least a common understanding in EU, I think that we could grow on this with other emerging economies, and this is actually the starting point. But cybercrime is an international crime. It's not a European crime. Does it not help just to actually look at it as an international issue? We're we not, we not shooting ourselves in the foot about saying it's European. Cybercrime is certainly um, international in scope um, and in terms of the people and the resources that are used to commit cybercrime. That's, that's, a, that's a given. One of the key things about computer crime, cybercrime, or technology in general, is that it evolves so rapidly. Uh, we're relying on uh, a convention which was drawn up more than a decade ago in order to inform our, our legal response to that, and I think that's unfortunate. So, so why were our authorities so slow? Because one thing we know about organised crime in general, and particularly cybercrime, is that these criminals are nimble, they're fast, they adapt quickly, but authorities just can't seem to keep up. 
the question is not so, so much about the convention, because I, I think that, that we are actually changing this very rapidly. I think that there is a consensus on understanding. But Rick said we're looking, we've got a convention from 2001. Yeah, but you have to understand that the most of the crime that is taking place in cybercrime can actually be, be dealt with by the normal criminal system for the conviction side. If you steal, you steal information, it doesn't matter if it's virtual or if it's actually physical. The problem is obtaining evidence where we need to do this in a much more speedy way than we are used to with normal organized crime and, and drug traffic and whatever. Here we need a change. We have a lot of challenges, but we'll deal with it. How on earth are you going to bring countries on board who have no interest in, in basically handing over cyber criminals. There will always be rogue states. How do you catch a criminal, for example, who at the moment is in Russia? Russia's not really complying. How can you catch a hacker from there? I think the challenge is perhaps even bigger than that, that one of the biggest problems when it comes to uh, successful prosecution of cybercrime is attribution. Um, it's very difficult to know where your actual physical criminal body is sitting. What criminals routinely do is to route traffic through several different jurisdictions before it exits out onto the public internet. Um, they may use other people's compromised systems as proxies, so criminal traffic could be being proxied through your PC in order to attack somebody else. Does that make you the criminal? Does that mean we can attribute the crime to you? And unless you can have access to, uh, and to a certain extent control of, every step along that chain of machines that were used in the perpetration of a crime, you're going to be seriously lacking evidence. Um, and it's the, the technical difficulties behind gaining access to that evidence is one thing, but also the, um, the lack of ability, and I don't mean to sound offensive, but the lack of ability within law enforcement, the lack of familiarity with the tools and techniques that are used, um, is, a, is a serious hamstringing to those kinds of investigations. So, so what's the profile of the agents working at the Cybercrime Centre in The Hague? They are experts. Uh, they are educated in the police, outside the police. They have the best education. But is it traditional law enforcement? Or? It's, it's, it's both and. We, we, we both have the law enforcement ones, and now we're recruiting from a non-law enforcement background because we realize we also need that kind of expert. But, but if I was a criminal, I just wouldn't act within a country that's uh, complying with the legal process. I would, I'd go to a different country. You know, we see that a lot. We s <laughs> Traditionally, um, criminals within uh, Russia and the former Commonwealth of Independent States, there was a kind of unspoken agreement that they wouldn't commit, for example, credit card fraud, stealing financial details within their own geographic location because that laid them open to prosecution far more easily. Um, so most of those uh, Russian and Eastern European criminals were targeting countries other than their own for exactly that reason because it protected them to a large degree from prosecution. I agree completely with Rick here, but we have seen also that there is a shift. In Russia, you have a middle class that needs to be protected. They also use the internet. You see exactly the same in China. They also need us. We cannot do this alone, but this region can be better, and then we can work with other regions. So I'm, you know, optimistic, but I, I know it's difficult. I know we have to, we, we're starting five minutes to 12. It will cost some resources and effort, but I'm sure that, that we have not lost the battle. Just quickly, we quoted at the beginning a figure of $1 trillion uh, lost in cybercrime. That was a figure that was used by President Obama back in 2009. But there is a lot of controversy over the, kind of the cost of cybercrime. Yeah. What, what's your opinion on that figure? I don't think the trillion dollar figure is at all reliable. Um, we're certainly talking hundreds of millions. Um, of dollars in terms of global cost of cybercrime, but these are not the kinds of people who file tax returns. And any individual or organization who tells you that they can give you a number for the cost of cybercrime is simply not telling you the truth. I think we can say that the fact that there are these new cybercrime centers cropping up now across the world is, it does show that there is a commitment internationally to fight cybercrime. I'd like you to listen to this uh, soundbite from Pete Soma, who's a cybercrime security expert. We have an over-proliferation of semi-competing agencies. Uh, there is the Europol, Interpol um, com competition, if you will, but you've also got uh, an agency called ENISA, funded by the Commission based in uh, Crete, and you have a NATO-based operation in Tallinn, uh, Estonia. Now, how are all these agencies going to work together, and are they going to compete for funding and attention? It's a very good question. It's a very good question, and uh, it's, it's such a good question because I really want to explain that he is wrong about his assumption here. We have in EC3 a very inclusive approach. In ESA, it's an EU agency look at a critical infrastructure, the search to harden it. They will continue to do their work. CEPOL is another EU agency which makes training.
and they will still make training, maybe on behalf of us, because we can identify it. Interpol, we have from day number one, I have invited the chief of Interpol to be part of the EC3 implementation team. I know that we need to be inclusive here, but we also need not to compete. There is so much crime in this area, there's enough for everybody. So it's not a waste of money? No. Absolutely not? No. As individuals, what can we do to protect ourselves? As individuals, there are some very important and free of charge things that we can do to protect ourselves. Uh, make sure that any operating systems, whether it's Windows, Mac OS, Linux, whatever it might be, are kept up to date. Uh, make sure any applications that you use are kept up to date. And finally, make sure that you're aware that anything that you post online becomes public domain and remains public domain forever. If it's something that you're not happy shouting out at the top of your voice in a crowded shopping center, don't ever post it online. So the money would be better spent, the money for Europol, for example, would be better spent in these kind of awareness campaigns so younger generations learn how to work the internet more safely? I don't think it's, it's either or, it's both and. I think that we should still have a police investigating and trying to prevent crime. But I think that we should together, and this is not the police budget, it's more, I guess, an educational budget. My kids are spending 80% of their awake time at the internet and nobody tells them how to act, to react or to interact or what is dangerous and what they shouldn't do, where they shouldn't go. And I think we first of all need this. But then, of course, you also need to make it unattractive uh, to be a criminal, and that's why we also need the police. Gentlemen, many thanks for joining us on the front line. As we've been hearing, we as individuals can do a lot to keep safe from cyber criminals. It's worth keeping that in mind when we open up our social media accounts. Did you know that about 600,000 Facebook accounts are hacked into each day? We'd like to hear about your cybercrime experiences. Our conversation continues on social media. In the meantime, On the Front Line returns next month.